Hello, everyone. Welcome to the OG Original Glory podcast. I'm your host, John Carlson. With me in the studio, as always, is my boy, KD. What's up? KD, good to see you, man. You too. What's happening? Uh, it's been a good, good long week. I'm tired, though. But uh, thankful to be back from vacation, back in, uh, back home, back in the grind. And um, it was a trip of extremes. I got to hang out with... Uh, people on the very, very high end of, uh, the economic class. And also got to spend some time with people on the very, very, very low end of, uh, of that. And just a lot of stark, uh, difference between that. So coming home, very thankful. So thankful that, uh, live here in Phoenix and thankful for our home and yeah, so it's good to be here with you guys. Yeah, it's a good it's a good place to live, and um, your burrito story was uh, epic. So my son and I are in downtown LA for this volleyball tournament, and we need to get some food for breakfast. It's like ten thirty, so we walk three or four blocks. We're in the city, city, like right in the middle of everything: the homeless, the uh, violence, the drugs. It's all all there on display, and we go and get these burritos or recommended and it's a storefront so you just walk up and order and there's no place to sit there's a couple people sitting or standing eating their burritos outside on the street and we walk uh these couple of blocks and i asked my son after we order you know what do you want to do and he's like uh can we go back to the hotel i'm like sure and you're like you want to walk back and he's like "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh so just the the people out there uh there were some some people already arguing and it was very aggressive. Felt like a fight was about to break out. So we call an Uber and um, we're waiting for it. And I turned to my left and about 50 feet from us was a homeless person. And he decided he had to use the bathroom. So he drops his drawers and just urinates on the sidewalk. He's not behind a street sign or a tree or, I mean, he just doesn't care out in the open. And then turns around and wants to go number two, (laughs) just right there. I mean, in some cases I was like, wow, that's, I don't know, like if he's on something or if he's just like, I don't care. Like I couldn't do that. So, and I was just like, Daniel, look at that. That's crazy. And, uh, and then he comes and walks, starts talking to us and, and that's fine. Right. I mean, I was trying to be nice and kind, but at the same time, I'm like, please don't touch me. Cause he's like starting to get real handsy and animated with the stories. <laughs> I'm like, dude, <laughs> there's, I'm sure you could go into a hotel or something. I don't know. But, uh, it was, uh, you know, it's still sad. Like, I mean, I don't feel pity for him. Just empathy. Like the place was dirty and, uh, you know, they're just, seems like there's a lot of resources available in that area that could really, you know, at least make the place clean and give people a place to use their restroom, you know? So that was rough. And then, uh, yeah. So we got the Uber, got out of there and that turned into a, I don't know, half hour, hour long teaching moment with my son as we uh, ate our burritos. So that was, that was good. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's a problem that's not unique to the city that you're staying in. Right. right. I mean, like we have, we have those issues here in the Valley. I mean, I've been spending more time down downtown myself mm-hmm. here in Phoenix. And, um, you know, one of the things that we hope to do through OG, um, the clothing line is, uh, utilize something that we call first 10 to help with those kinds of problems. And I think specifically we'll start with local, uh, charities in yeah. the area. And, and what we mean by that with first 10 is the first 10 cents, um, on every dollar that you spend on OG products, we're going to give towards a worthy cause. That's the first 10 of the gross. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of need. There's a lot of need here locally. There's certainly a lot of need all over our country. Um, but that's something that we're, uh, committed to being engaged in. And we're still kind of figuring that out. I mean, this is very early on in the, in the podcast and the launch of the clothing line, but we have kind of set that up. Um, it is a principle. Uh, one of our ethos that we're going to abide by is that first 10 principle. Yeah. So I'm super excited for that. And, and I think that's really important. What I'll also 
fired up about is you and I were talking um, about being engaged uh, with that populace here in our home in Phoenix. And just um, through some of our other friends, they, they do food drives and hand out food. But we were also talking about bringing out T-shirts um, with identity messages like dignity. And um, I feel like that's really important, especially after just experience in being in L.A. Like you can just feel the anger. Yeah. And I, I, feel, I felt anger. I was like, this sucks. Like if I had to like live here, I'd be upset about it. Yeah. Like the conditions aren't okay. And, um, 36 bucks for two burritos. Oh, that was the other thing. Yeah. $36 for two burritos. Yeah. It's bananas. Like in a, you know, in an area that's, that's struggling. That's, yeah. that blows me away. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty wild, but you know, stay tuned on that. Um, just know that if you, if you dig the message, you can check us out at originalglory.com. You can find our gear and that the first 10 cents on every dollar spend is going to go towards a worthy cause because we, we do have a heart for humanity. We believe that Jesus has heart for, for humanity, present tense. Um, so, but with us in the studio today is um, our good friend, Eric Hansen. Um, we're going to welcome Eric to the podcast. Uh, we're psyched to have Eric on. Um, so Eric, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we would love it if you would just briefly tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you know, like, are you married? You know, what do you do for a living? You, you know, you're from the Valley kind of type thing. Sure. So, uh, I'm married, live here in town. I'm a crazy native. I was born in Phoenix. Wow. Get yeah. out. Yeah. You don't meet many of those. What hospital were you born at? St. Joseph's wow. right, right down in the middle of Phoenix. Man. Very cool. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. You are a legit native. You and my sister, she was born at uh, what used to be desert Samaritan hospital. Nice. Back in the eighties, but you weren't in the eighties. <laughs> I was a wee bit before that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I grew up here, went to high school here, you know, graduated, went away to Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California. Yeah. Which is a killer place to go to school. Heck yeah, it is. Um, nice yeah. beaches. Yeah. Yep. Um, finished there, moved back to Washington, D.C., got involved in politics, went to graduate school up in Connecticut, moved to New Mexico, back to California, migrate, got married. Had a kid, moved back to Phoenix, had another child, um, changed business, changed vocations like three times. I have a resume you could never replicate even if you tried. <laughs> it's impossible. We are looking forward to getting into that. Um, yeah. And uh, in the midst of all that, um, I have been growing up, even though I'm turning 55 this year, which is crazy, hard to what? imagine. Dude, yeah, we, know just, we I know. just had your 50th birthday party. It, that was bonkers. like last week. Yeah, exactly. It's bonkers. Oh my gosh. So, You're looking good for 55, my friend. Right? I would never even guess. Right on. I'll take that as a compliment. Very Thank you, King D. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, it's crazy. And even though I'm turning 55, I feel like a kid. I still feel like, what am I going to do when I grow up? You know, that whole oh, question. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'll figure it. Life is like way out there. I'll figure it out someday kind of a thing. But I guess in the long story short is, is that God's been kind of fathering me a little bit later in life. I needed a little remedial catch up. Um, and that's been good. So I'm here, I build homes for a living houses, mostly like townhome type projects. And so I'm a small builder developer and guy just trying to navigate his way. And that's the shtick. Nice, man. That's awesome. Thank you for that. Um, Man, I'm looking forward to getting into your story. So if you don't mind, we'd love it if you take us back, you know, tell us a little bit about the early years and just kind of progress on, on through things that way. Yeah. So like I said, I grew up here and I, you know, I had a, in a lot of ways, I had a great family. I had a mom and dad who really loved me. Uh, I have two sisters, but bottom line is from a, from like a, uh, a God perspective, it was more religion. So I was raised in the in the uh, Lutheran church and went through confirmation classes and all that good stuff, all of which are good. But really what I got out of it was a heaping dose of legalism. And um, I left, when I left for college, it was just kind of, I would say the best way to describe it is burnt out and almost like um, sort of the Jack Nicholson line, is this as good as it gets? Mm. And I went to a Christian college, so Westmont's a Christian college, so I, I entered there and 
kind of just in some ways rebelled or pushed it away. It's not that I, w- I went crazy and jumped off the deep end with, you know, living some massive sinful life, although pride was certainly a, a massive factor, which we'll get into later. But, you know, it was just like, I looked around and I thought, gosh, it's like, this isn't that great what I was seeing in a lot of ways. And, um, and I think looking back on it, it's because it wasn't relational. It was rule-based. It was sort of principles, theology, and there was no life in it. I, I never got that. I never got that from church. I never got that from um, what I learned growing up. Um, and I got some good things, don't get me wrong. And I got, I got love in a lot of ways, but um, that was just missed along the way. So that was kind of early years that set, set me up, I think, in some ways for some issues downstream. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you and I have that in common. Grew up in the Lutheran church as well. I, I did. And a lot of good things, a lot of good people. Yep. But um, I think for me, anyways, the, the big thing was faith was not essential. It was definitely checking the box. And it was viewed very clearly by my parents as not something that was necessary for navigating the Monday through Saturday. It was something that we fit in on Sunday and it was important and we all got, we got dressed up and ultimately I did, you know, go through confirmation and do all that stuff too. That was important to my folks, but practically speaking, there was a real big gap there, you know? And so I think it, it, I remember a lot of stories from the old Testament that I, that I picked up on. Um, I don't really remember the message of grace kind of your point about legalism. And I'm not saying that that church was a legalistic church or anything like that. Um, I may have not just not picked up on it. Like I just might've been oblivious, but I think it had more to do with you know, just, just the environment in which I was raised. And my parents were like yours. They love me. They're good parents and and, and I love them and I have a great relationship with them, but somehow there was just a disconnect there, you know? So, you know, it's interesting, the church that I went to growing up and just, this just hit me as, as you were talking, there was a, the church kind of came to a big spire up into the ceiling, going way up, had this massive vaulted ceiling. And there's a tapestry behind the altar that you're looking at when you're sitting in the church. And it's a tapestry of Jesus holding a staff with little sheep around his feet, looking very kind of placid and, you know, the, the good shepherd. Um, But as a kid growing up, it always looked weak was the, was what hit me. Like Mm. there was no, the majesty, the, the power, the transformational ability, the miracles, the um, warrior God. Where, where was he? And I think given my own story of sort of not being initiated in the masculine journey in the way that I think most young men, boys want to be, um, it just, it almost angered me. I would look at that tapestry. And when I left, I was like, I don't want to see that anymore. Mm. That was sort of my picture of Jesus. That was my picture of God. And to me, I looked at that and I was like, I, I just can't relate to that. I can't, I don't, I don't get that as a young man. I didn't, it didn't appeal to me. And I think that combined with some of the, what I'll call legalism or lack of relational or lack of like it hitting an impact in your life. It was more like you said, you know, we go to church because we should go to church because it's the right thing to do because it's what you're supposed to do. All those kinds of things. Um, it, it just almost became something that pushed me away. Mm. And, you know, looking at it now, I see that, okay, that's one facet of God, but I didn't, I didn't pick up a lot of the other things that I guess I was craving at that point in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So whether that be in high school leading up Mm -hmm. to when you went to college or in college where we're kind of at in your story, where do you, where do you go looking for life at that point? Yeah. So I think a couple of things happened. One is, so I sort of pushed away from the church and I, and And what I saw at Westmont, even though there were, I mean, there were, a lot of this was judgment that I had. So put that out there. A lot of pride on my part, thinking that, uh, you know, I was going to chart my own way and there's a better way to do life. And, you know, I I guess I had a little bit of disdain at that point 
or what I would quote call sort of the religious group at, at school. You know, there were those people that were really on fire and they went mm-hmm. to chapel all the time and lots of prayer meetings. And, and I'm not sure at this point I could even evaluate whether they were sincere or not. I just couldn't relate. And I was never really called into that. And because of my own baggage and the way that I looked at God, the way that I looked at myself, the way that I looked at life, I couldn't, I couldn't engage that for whatever reason. Um, secondly, I turned to performance. There was a lot of that in my childhood. My dad was pretty critical. He had a pretty decent temper and he had um, a way of at times could overlook something huge and at times could make a really big deal out of something that was nothing. And so for me, what I picked up in, in my own story, you know, I wasn't the world's greatest, biggest, strongest athlete. I wasn't, um, you know, I didn't come from some trust fund. I looked around and it was like, you know, I, I, I somehow picked up, well, performance is the way to do it. So if you're supposed to go to college, you know, you, well, what do you do? Right. You get good grades. Okay. Mm-hmm. And if you're, and what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to be involved. Right. I mean, and figure out what you're going to do with your life. Right. Make a plan, work your plan, get after it. And so uh, that, and I think chasing the beauty became a way that I found life. Mm-hmm. It made me feel alive, so to speak. And, um, when what's, I lo- what's beauty? What do you mean by beauty? Chasing Eve, chasing, chasing the girls, the chasing, ladies. yeah. And, and it's not that I was like this, some crazy womanizer, but what I found was I, when I, when I would engage with what I call a woman at that point, I mean, I was really a little boy inside, but she was a woman. Um, I, I couldn't, I couldn't stay myself. I didn't know myself and I would get lost in that relationship. So what happened was, is how she was doing, how this relationship was doing, how it made me feel, what it brought to me became that sort of life giver, if you will. Right. Oh yeah. And I didn't have it coming from God because I was sort of pushing him away and I was trying to make my own way. This was a, you know, this was a party of one, you know, Eric party one, Eric, <laughs> um, it, that looked really good, right? That, that felt good. Um, and so I think the other reason why it, it became attractive was for the obvious reasons that, hey, Eve is, Eve is good, right? Um, my family story, the kind of the, the family muck, I'll call it, or the mosh pit, emotionally, I left when I went away to school. I kind of said, well, you know, without getting into the particulars about my family, I looked around and I'm like, well, you know, everybody's kind of got issues, right? Dad's got his issues. My mom's got her issues. My other sister's got issues, but oh, I'm not going to have issues, right? I'm going to be different. I'm going to, I'm going to go off and conquer this thing called life. Right. And I'm yep. just, oh, I'm not going to fall into that trap. So I went off and, and, and it sort of walled off. I didn't deal with those things. I didn't know how to deal with those things. And what ended up by happening is a sort of, you know, you know what happens when you wall off part of your heart, you wall off all your heart. The good stuff doesn't really come in either. And so when the beauty comes along and you get that, you know, that rush inside, it's like, whoa, <laughs> what is that? Right. And so I, you know, it was hook, line and sinker. I, I, I couldn't engage with my friends like I needed to at the time. I lost some friendships that kind of just fell off the way because it was like, everything got poured into that, you know, what I'm calling quotes around it, Eve at that point. And so, and of course what happened, I got, you know, I got shellacked, I got crushed that ended and it needed to end. And when it did, it was like, okay, oh boy, that hurt. So, um, I think that was another area that I looked for life. So I would say it was performance mostly, but secondarily that. Yeah. Yeah. That seems to be a pretty common theme with men, you know, and for those of you out there, if you hear these terms on our podcast, the beauty Eve, um, we're, we're talking about, about women. Um, you know, it, it, there, there, there are a couple of nice expressions that lend like, a the, the mythic quality, I guess that, that females really deserve ultimately, you right. know, uh, created in beauty, created in glory, created in, you know, the garden. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyways, um, very, very common th- themes. Yeah. It seems like, as you listen to a lot of men's stories, right. you know, we tend to take our question to performance, ultimately work, and um, to the beauty, to Eve. What right. question are you talking about? Uh, questions of validation. 
Thank you. That's good too. If you hear us say your question on this podcast, a lot of times we're talking about the question of uh, validation and the question of like, well, where can I find life? Do I have what it takes to be a man? Do I have what it takes to be a man? You know, will you tell me that I, that I'm a man? Will you tell me that you love me? That's a, that's a big question. Am I loved? Right? Like questions of love, identity, validation. Who am I? Maybe you're beautiful and amazing. You can tell me who I am. Um, Those are all very common threads if you listen to a man's story, I think. Right. I think, you know, looking back on it, it was, um, you know, what I, what I call the beauty that I was chasing at the time. Um, she was actually a great gal. She had a lot going for her. She had a good heart. She was beautiful. Yeah. No doubt about it. But the problem was I was looking for my identity out of that. I was looking to get something from her that would try to quote, make me right or make me feel that I was on the right track or make me feel that I understood what I was or make me feel like a man. I probably couldn't even have told, I, in fact, I know I couldn't have told you that at that time, Yeah, but that's what I was doing. I was trying to make myself all right. And this is, you know, right. Well, what do you do? You, man, you know, I'm dating somebody that everybody else wants to date. This is pretty cool. Right. I mean, this is, you know, for sure. Hey, you know, I'm on the right track. Right. And, and it could have been the right track. The problem was I was way off track. Yeah. That was the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there's a lot there. I think in early life as a young man, you tend to go largely based on what, what makes you feel good emotions. Right. And certainly people saying, attaboy, she's a looker. Like that doesn't, that doesn't help (laughs) ultimately. Right. Like it's just going to encourage you to go down that path. And and then, um, you know, there's, there's what's presented in the world as being life. Right. And all you have to do is turn on the TV or go watch a movie. And what's, what's presented as life for a young man, especially growing up in, you know, like the seventies the and eighties in, in America. I mean, the, the picture of masculinity is, is, is James Bond or, Charlie's I, Angels, the fair faucet poster yeah, on the yeah, wall. Totally. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I don't know. Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones, w- whatever. Yeah. Indiana Jones is still pretty cool. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, so, so anyways, just to clarify some things for those of you out there who are, are listening, you're going to pick up a lot of these uh, expressions as we move through things and we'll try to pause and, and explain what we're, what we're talking about. So it's not some kind of esoteric conversation. Um, so as you move through college, you, you continue down the path of education though, correct? Or did you move into the professional world, uh, immediately after college? How does yeah. that, how does that so play out? I, uh, I graduated college and like two days after, you know, walk the line and get out, I moved back to Washington DC and I took a political job working on a little local campaign outside of Washington from a, uh, a political kind of guru back there who recruited young people to work on campaigns. Really? Yeah. And did that, lived right outside of Washington, DC and met a ton of people, had a blast. It was great. Yeah. Was Um, that pretty exhilarating at that time of life? You know, it it was fun. What, what was good about it is that I went to a place where I knew nobody. So it was kind of the metaphor, metaphorical wilderness for me. It was the first time where I really launched out. I mean, literally I packed up, I moved, I flew on a, you know, a flight, I get off the plane, somebody picks me up that I've never met. They take me to a house where I'm boarding to a guy that I'm living with who I've never met. I've never even talked to the guy before I show up at his house. Um, so I'm, I've got a room and board. They give me a car to use. The next day I start work. I'm just running around with the campaign manager doing campaign political stuff. And um, it was great because you know, Friday, Saturday night would come around. And if I wasn't working, it's like, well, Hey, call a friend. Oh, I don't have any. Uh, Hey, where should I go? Don't even know. I don't know the city. I don't know. Anything. I've never even been to Washington, DC. I've never been to Northern Virginia. I didn't know. I didn't know anything. So what it forced me to do was really deal with, okay, what is it like being alone? What is it like not to have somebody to call? Um, what is it? You know, you, you kind of just grapple with questions, um, loneliness, direction, am I doing the right thing? All those kinds of questions. So it was good in a lot of ways. It was like going out and having to, even though I wasn't really taking care of myself per se, because I had a job and it had been, you know, I knew what I was getting into. I had to in some ways stand on my own two feet for the first time, you know, where you don't have the, the, 
cadence and the rhythm of college and dorm life and friends and social stuff going on all the time. It was like, okay, I got to like, whatever happens I is whatever happens. And I got to kind of figure that out. Right. Yeah. So it was, it was good. It was, I did that for, um, that rolled into another political job. I uh, ended up by working for a great national lobbying gra- kind of grassroots lobbying organization, um, which I'm still involved with to this day, which is really cool. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, and so I did that for a couple of years and was involved in sort of state legislative activity throughout the United States and some national political activity. And it was really great. Met some fantastic people and grew up a little bit, um, had just some really unique experiences with, you know, high level political people that taught me a, a ton of great things. Um, just life lessons. It really, I mean, politics for sure, campaigns for sure, but life lessons, you know, you you know, how to, how to deal with criticism, how to deal with somebody coming in your office and just shredding the letter that you wrote. You know, there's nothing on it, just blobs of red ink everywhere. You come in and just arms flailing and, you know, yelling at you and, but, but they were great people. I learned a ton. It was really fun. So, um, did that for a couple of years and then went to graduate school, went to, went to the Yale school of management because of course, you know, once again, getting back to the performance thing, right? So if you're going to go you're going to go to business school where you go, you should try to, I mean, let's go to the best business school, right? Or Absolutely. Not, not that I can yeah. get into the business, best business school. Cause I didn't, but, um, I got into Yale somehow, some way, this little kid from Phoenix who's got no blue blood and doesn't know anybody. I've never been <laughs> to Connecticut. I didn't even know where Yale was when I interviewed for the, with the admissions director. It was like crazy. So I got in, I go to business school and you know, it was great in some ways, but it was kind of a lonely time. Um, had fun. There were good people there, but I didn't really fit in. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I went there because once again, I was kind of seeking validation. I was sort of seeking identity and I was chasing this myth that, well, business performance, business success of some flavor, even though I didn't know what that was, I was chasing it. I went there because I thought I should, not because I had a calling, not because God was leading me, not because I had some fantastic plan, even that I had cooked up. I was literally just honestly trying to do the best thing and chase some thing out there. You know, success was out there somewhere. And I looked at business school and Yale as, oh, of course it's going to help me. Right. I mean, I'll, I'll be closer to something. I don't know exactly what that is, but it felt good in some way or it fed some insecurity or made me feel validated. And so, yeah, did it, got, got a master's degree and MBA and with an emphasis in finance. And I thought, oh, oh, of course, well, if you're going to Yale School of Management, right, well, where should you go to work? Well, it's got to be management consulting with somebody like a McKinsey and company <laughs> or, or we got to do Wall Street, right? I mean, let's go, baby. If we're going to do it, let's, let's do go. it, let's do <laughs> yep. it all the way, right? So I started to interview for investment banking jobs. And, you know, they take you down to New York and Yale's got a big club in downtown New York and they own a building that's right by Times Square. It's, it's crazy. Or, or this train station downtown. And anyways, so you go into these really fancy old rooms and, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. You know, lots of mahogany. Oh yes. Lots of woodwork. <laughs> lots of woodwork. I'd love to say mahogany. Yeah. <laughs> but for a kid and for a young guy like me coming from Phoenix, that had never been exposed to that that for me was just like, oh, you know, this is the place to be, right? I was chasing the myth, right? I was chasing some fuzzy thing out there. Yeah. And, you know, I, I went through, I started to do that. And I'm like, oh my goodness, what, have, what am I doing? I looked around and said, okay, I'm working 90, 100 hours a week, living in some, you know, Cracker Jack <laughs> apartment with three people, you know, no life. And sure, there's money tied to it. But I, I, somewhere in the back of my head, you know, thank you, God, you, it, he rang a little bell like, uh, kid, I, I don't think this is for you. Mm. So crazy thing. I left graduate school. I had no idea what I was going to do. So think about that. You know, I've gone through an undergraduate degree in economics and business. I had actually done a summer program where I went, I tour, I traveled through Europe for 10 weeks with a group of like 50 students and six faculty going to the Soviet union and all these places at a time that you couldn't go on this really killer business trip. I, Take a couple of years. I'm in politics. I'm living in Washington D.C. as a young guy, thinking like, "Oh man, I'm really, you know, I'm this is this is the bomb, right?" Then I get into graduate school. It's Yale of all places, right? This knucklehead me that like is a nobody. I get out. I have nothing. I have no idea what I'm going to do. That's that's where I found myself. It was it was completely crazy. Which I look back on it, and I almost it's almost like disbelief. 
that it was like that. But on the other hand, I look at it, of course, I had no idea what I was chasing. I had no identity. I wasn't tied to God. I was floating around just looking at what I thought the world was telling me to do. And so, you know, I just kind of chased that. I chased that dream. And even though it was so fuzzy, I couldn't have even told you what was at the end of that. I just thought it was what I was supposed to do. Yeah. I think we would be amazed at how many people who seem to have it all together. I mean, I, I, I know your pedigree a little bit. Like, I didn't know all that. So thank you for sharing that with us. It's actually really awesome. But um, I, I think that we would be surprised at how many people don't have a real calling, direction, purpose. And maybe we shouldn't be, given the level of, of just general dissatisfaction with people and their right. employment out there in the marketplace. So you mentioned God ringing a bell in the back. Anywhere else where God shows up in the story in in that season? Yeah. So um, I'll kind of fast forward a little bit as to where I think God kind of really shows up. So yeah, I, uh, after graduate school, I go back down to Washington DC and I hook up with this other Yale alumni who was starting a lobbying group. And so we were going to, you know, reform the maritime industry and we were going to bust the maritime unions and all this stuff. And so, you know, I go down to Washington because I had no idea what I was going to do and work with this guy. And, you know, we're raising money and walking around Capitol Hill and doing our thing. And I quickly realized, you know, it's great and all this you know, in some ways a good opportunity, but it wasn't me. Once again, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know why I was doing what I was doing. I was just doing it. So I finally left that and I I decided I wanted to get a little closer back out to the West. I'd been on the East coast for several years and, you know, I've done Connecticut and DC and traveled a little bit. And I'm like, you know, I'm this guy from Phoenix. I need to get back to the, yeah, I got to get West. Go yes, go West young man. Right. So I'm like, I have no idea how to do that. I don't got two nickels to rub together. So, um, I talked to an old boss of mine who's also a political guy and he's like, well, I can't get you back to Arizona or California, but I can get you as far as New Mexico. Are you interested? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Let's go. <laughs> so I, I go to New Mexico. I run like eight campaigns in the 96 cycle, had a blast, met some great people, elected four state senators and representatives, just had, a, just had a hoot, ended up by working in the New Mexico legislature. And, um, I was the chief of staff to the to uh, that one of the Senate leaders there wow. um, just had a really good time. It was, it was, a, it was a cool thing and met some really neat people traveled all over the state and then realized, okay, it, it's time to get out of politics. Like, right. I got to get back to this business thing, which I thought still was like the thing I'm supposed to do, even though I hadn't really done any of it to that point. So I ended up by moving back to Santa Barbara and that's where God kind of showed up. So I get back to Santa Barbara. I take a job with a real estate development consulting firm and, um, I'm getting older, you know, I'm starting to hit 30 and, you know, a lot of the friends are getting married. Life is starting families, you know, they got starting businesses, kind of figuring things out. And I'm kind of like, well, I've got a good job now. Right. I mean, I'm doing okay. But honestly, I hadn't still had no idea. Like what, what am I really doing? And I found myself kind of wrestling with that more and more. And I started to get angry. You know, what I got was, why isn't life working out? Why do I not want to know what I do? Why have I not found the right woman to marry? Mm. Why, you know, why it's all these why questions. And what it turned into is God, why is it not working out? Why is this crazy little life that I'm chasing so hard, right? Working so hard. You know, I, I went to the right school. I did the right thing. I got great grades. I met all these people. I've done all these interesting things, right? Why, why am I not happy? Why is it not working? Why, you know, and so at that point, um, had a friend who kind of said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to this counselor, this Christian counselor. And I think you might, I think you might really benefit. And at first I was like, oh yeah, right. You know, and it's kind of dismissed it like, oh, I don't have an issue. Right. I don't, I don't, I don't need a counselor. Right. That's for people who have problems. Right. Yeah. And God's just like, uh, yeah, kid, you, you got some problems. You need some counseling. <laughs> <laughs> and so. Somehow I got there. Somehow I went, which is crazy because I, you know, was too prideful and thought that I could figure, you know, once again, life was, it was my job to figure it out. Right. That's kind of what I believed. And so, um, what happened was, is I got really angry and started to dig into some feelings and with some help. I, so I ended up going to counseling for like three years. It was fantastic. And I, you know, I just wrestled with God. I finally started to get real. 
And in sort of that anger and that bitterness and sort of digging into my story and why was I the way that I was and why did I feel and think the way that I did and in some ways to get into at least scratch the surface of identity, even though she never really could kind of lead me into that or didn't, I don't think it was really, you know, it wasn't her thing, but really helped me a lot. And so I started to just wrestle with God. I remember nights where I'd go down by the beach and just, you know, raging in my car, just yelling at the top of my voice, like, you know, okay, mm-hmm. God, you're big enough. You got big shoulders. Let's go. I, you know, what about this? And what about that? And just, I mean, literally just having these like fights with God, emotional fights. And you know, God does what he does. He stands there and he takes it. He listens. He loves you. And that was kind of the beginning when I look back on it of, okay, I started to grow up a little bit. I started mm-hmm. to, um, in a first infant little steps kind of have some kind of a beginning of some sort of relationship with God that wasn't churchy, that wasn't religion. It was, it was God. And, uh, and that was a great thing. That was good. That was really good. Raw and real. Yeah. 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 You're yeah. Yeah. It An wasn't, it wasn't some formula. Yeah. I wasn't doing it because, Oh, this was the, this is the thing you do, right? Like you're supposed to grow up, get to 30, not have any clues to what you want to do with the rest of your life and go see a counselor. That's the plan, dude. Right. That's, <laughs> I mean, get on that road, huh? And, and yet that's, I mean, when I'm honest, that's where I found myself, even though on the outside to a lot of people look like, Oh, look at all the things he's done, places he's lived. Look what he's, Oh man, he's been to, you know, New York, Washington, DC, been to Yale. He's been to this. He's done that. He's, you know, run campaigns. He's raised money. He's yada, yada, yada. And really I was empty. Mm. I was, I found myself on empty. And so that's, I would say the first time where sort of, I had enough where I let my own guard down and was at least real enough with God to say, okay, I, I, I can't do this thing myself. And so that's where, that's where I think as an adult, it's kind of really where in some real way, God enters the picture. I, I, he was always there, obviously. I allowed him to be part of my life, I guess is a better way to say it. Yeah. Sounds like the thirst was there for life all along. All totally. You know, I, was, I was looking for him. I just had no idea that yeah. that's where it was found. Isn't that funny? You can grow up. I grew up in the church. I went to confirmation classes, three years of those. You know how that goes. I do. Mm-hmm. I go to a Christian college, which was a great place, great people. And I totally missed it. I didn't get the real deal. And I look back and I go, how can that be? And then I look around at life and I look around at the, you know, kind of now being 55 and I look back and I go, wow, I think a lot of people miss the real deal. I missed the real deal. I can tell you that. Yeah. Do you it, think you missed it or do you think you didn't, you didn't see it? I, Cause I, my story is in a lot of ways very similar to yours uh-huh. and I view like my experience growing up in the church as the seed that was planted. And even though I didn't have the experience with church, like the way I understand my relationship with God now, which is, which I really wish I would have had then I still would credit, like just being there and being pointed to God or knowing God for at least planting the seed so that eventually I could have that moment. Like you had your moment of, arguing with God, like the argument with God, like coming to God in that infant place. I mean, that's very much like an infant, right? Infants can't communicate. So what do they do? They cry, lash out. Right. Right. Your, your, your desire is for the father. Right. And you're like, communicate with me, like finally opening up to that. But in that infinite time or in, in that, in your maturity, you're an infant. So all that, all it comes out as is raw emotion. Right. Yeah. I, you know, I'm not sure fully how to answer that question, but what hits me is, you know, I think through my own woundedness, my own story, um, and I wasn't able to get some of what you described, David, mm-hmm. some of it was there. And in some ways I think the seeds were planted, you know, um, it wasn't all bad. Right. I mean, it's never all bad. But so I wasn't able to um, engage or receive the good parts. But I think in truth, 
I only got part of the picture. And, you know, I mean, it's like a, it's like a seed, you know, like God says, the seed gets tossed out on the, you know, on the rocks and has no water and bakes in the sun. Well, it's great that it's a seed, but it takes more than that for life. Right. Yeah. And what I got was like one piece. And when you view some of the other things through other people's wounded stories and through your own wounded story and through the hurts and kind of the arrows that come and the, and the agreements that you make with things that aren't true about life that you think are true, um, because the world's telling you they're true, right? I mean, it's telling you all the time that, you know, all kinds of messages that I was grabbing onto partially. I, you know, I wasn't able, I wasn't able to get it. So whether I didn't get it or it was there all the time and I just couldn't see it, it was probably a combination of both. But I think that in some ways it wasn't there to be had because what was had was a very incomplete picture and it was missing the crazy wild adventure that's life with God. Like it, that, that wasn't there. And so I'm not sure, you know, how many, how many flavors you put on that in the cake and how many, you know, colors you paint on that canvas. If, if the real God alive, loving, interested, wild, crazy, adventurous warrior God is not in the mix somewhere. Like, what do you really have? What do you, what do you, what do you get? And if you're getting it, do you even want it? Right. That's, that's kind of, I think, how I describe it. Yeah, that's spoken well. It makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I get that. I uh, appreciate what you said there, how you identify with a lot of his story, how there's a lot of similarities. Because we're very early in this, we're, we're going to say this, and hopefully we'll remember to say this a lot. We pray that you would look for the similarities in these stories and not the differences. I see a lot of similarities. You know, there's the, being raised in the, the Lutheran environment, there's, there's the, the Christian college, both, both things that uh, are present in my story as well. I didn't work in politics. You know, I didn't, didn't bounce around the country and have the wild adventures that you had. Um, by the way, I love that there is that backdrop, that wildness, the wildness of God in your story. We'll circle yeah. back to that. But we pray for you out there that you would listen for the similarities in these stories and not the differences. I mean, maybe you didn't grow up in a Christian home, but maybe there are other common threads with, with Eric's story that you can identify with. And, um, you know, two, two of the three of us sitting at the table are recovery guys. And one of the things that we look for in recovery in stories are the similarities and not the differences. And in fact, that's something that's espoused in a program of recovery and helps people get well is not looking for the differences so that we can tear things down and say, oh, but that, that, you know, that's him, not me or her, not me. I mean, when you walk into a room of recovery, you might have some guy that was homeless a week ago, sharing at the podium and his story or her story can be powerful and can help rescue you no matter where you're at. So yeah, it's all really good. Where do you, where do you go from there? Where do where do things go from there? Yeah. Well, so, um, I would say, you know, that, so there was a couple of years where, like I said, I wrestled with God and started to, you know, kind of come out of that. And in some ways, you know, start to live a little bit with him, um, at least in some sort of infant new, you know, young boy ways, if you will. And, uh, so I, I got involved in business in Santa Barbara and, um, I ended up by starting a direct mail and data management um, kind of partnered up with some guys who had a small business and they asked me to be part of it. And, and I joined them and we kind of grew this business in Santa Barbara. And I did that for a few years. And along the way, lo and behold, I, you know, came home to visit my parents one weekend for Thanksgiving and I'm going down to a U2 concert the day after Thanksgiving. Cause I was a big U2 fan. And so some friends of mine went down there and I, I, uh, I'm sitting on the sidewalks. I'm trying to get into like, you know, the, the heart, the middle, like the private area in front of the stage where like the first 200 people, you know, you get on the floor and you're like right in the middle of the stage there. So I'm down there and you know, my friends and I, it's a couple hours. We're sitting on the sidewalk and of course we're getting hungry and we need some coffee. So we walk into the, the uh, ground floor of the Hyatt hotel. Cause this, the concert was down at, um, then it was kind of I think America West arena or the sun's play. So we're going in, there was an Einstein's in the ground floor of the Hyatt hotel at the time. 
And I walk in one side of the deal and this really good looking lady walks in the door on the other side and we pass each other in the hall and I kind of make eye contact with her and I make a U-turn and sort of turn around and say, I'm, I follow her. I follow her <laughs> into the, I was going to go to the, ba- the bathroom first, but she's going into the coffee shop and I'm Pull like, a, a maverick in the original Top Gun. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, uh, I'm going into the coffee shop now. Um, so that was the day I met. She became my wife. So crazy story. I, I meet her in the coffee shop. We talk in line. I had this number on my hand. I had a number 100 and a smiley face written on my hand because I didn't want to leave line, right? Because if I leave line, no one's going to want me to cut back and they're going to think I'm cutting in line. They're going to, you know, kick me out. So there's this sort of numbering system. So I got this smiley face and number 100 to save my spot. So I'm, I'm in line and I put my hand on the counter and she looks at it and she's like, what, were you bored this morning coloring on yourself? And, uh, so we started talking, so I go have lunch with her I, you know, she's got a business, a, a salon business around the corner and long story short, 11 months later, I'm married, um, which is just totally crazy. So, um, she's fantastic. Um, I've been married now for over 20 years, which is nice. Crazy. Congrats. Wow, yeah, man. Thanks. Which is way cool. Um, and yeah, so, so that's kind of the next chapter, you know? get married, but I got married later in life. And I was 34 when I got married. Okay. So it, you know, and I'm looking back on it, like God was so good because if I had tried that earlier than that, oh boy, the ship would have hit the rocks like hard. <laughs> I mean, Houston. No bueno, huh? Yeah. Yeah. No bueno. Like Houston, we'd have a big problem. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I had problems anyways, don't get me wrong. And that's part of my story too, but God was so good in at least getting me a little farther down the journey to grow up a little bit and at least have some start of a relationship with him first um, was just necessary. It just mm-hmm. had to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And at that time, uh, what were you doing uh, work-wise? So I still owned the uh, direct mail production business over in Santa Barbara. So my okay. wife was living in Arizona. Okay. I'm living in Santa Barbara. So we have this long distance, you know, romance. And I think it was something like four, four or five months to the day after I met her, I proposed. Oh, wow. So this is like, I mean, like, yeah, it was, it was like bada boom, bada bing. And just, you know, like lightning struck really. She owned a salon out here. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so you both have businesses, both have businesses, long distance relationship, long distance relationship, you know, ask her to marry me. She says, yes, we're planning a wedding. We ended up by getting married in Santa Barbara. It was awesome. Planned our own wedding, did her own gig. It was, it was really cool. Um, and so she ends up by moving to Santa Barbara and get married and we rent a little house and, you know, start making our way. So yeah, it was really great. And then first, uh, first child comes along, um, honeymoon, honeymoon surprise. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Didn't waste any time. No. And, and, <laughs> not planned by the way. Yeah. But once again, God absolutely knew what he was doing. I, I'm not sure we would have made it had we not had that, um, extra little kicker to the story. Right. And, um, so, you know, we get married and we're living there and, and, uh, you know, Santa Barbara is not the cheapest place in the world to live. Definitely it's beautiful. Not. It's fantastic, yeah. but it comes with the price tag. So we kind of looked around and with a young child and all of our families and you know, her family, my family are in Arizona. So we said, you know, we really should get back. We should we need a little support. And um, so we moved back to Phoenix. And at that point I sold my interest in my business and moved to Phoenix, had no idea what I was going to do. So we show up in Arizona at like the crazy time of, I think it was 2000 six or seven and you know what real estate prices were doing then. So we're trying to buy a home and it's the, you know, the bidding wars and all that kind of stuff going on and um, living in her, in her dad's home at the time, cause we don't have a place to live. And it was, it was crazy, but um, yeah. So we moved back and just sort of reshuffled the deck and started here in Phoenix again. Wow. Wow. I didn't realize that you moved back to Phoenix during the housing boom. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That is a crazy time to move back here. Yeah. And what did you ultimately end up doing? Uh, Ultimately, I ended up by being asked to join a building materials, a green technology, if you will, um, building materials startup out of Las Vegas. Somehow through a friend of a friend, I got hooked up with this guy and he needed money. He needed business direction. He needed kind of 
strategy and things. So I ended up by teaming up with him and, um, you know, we went out and we looked for venture capital money, private equity money. So we ended up by wow. raising 10 million in private equity fund from a clean tech fund out of California. Um, it's a really big deal for me. I mean, like, you know, so I, I found myself as I was the CEO of a, of a private equity backed startup. We raised $10 million. We're going to open a, a manufacturing facility and I'm traveling to China to look at, you know, raw materials and wow, it's crazy. Um, but I'm doing that with two young kids, a wife who's at home. I'm off working crazy hours. So we're in, we're living in Phoenix, the R and D plant and the sort of headquarters are in Las Vegas. And I'm basically going around the United States and, and the private equity funders are in Los Angeles and it's just nuts. And I'm so I'm trying to, I'm trying to do all this and, um, what happens in the midst of that? Well, I, I kind of neglect my family, not intentionally. Yeah. Um, but I think my wife starts to feel alone. Um, I start to feel overwhelmed and what God does in my story at that point, after a few years of doing that is he kind of says, you know, there's a lot of pride there. Eric. You know, I thought, you know, I had people in my ear at that point telling me, you know, Hey, you can write your ticket if this succeeds. Right. I mean, a, I've got stock and all this stuff. And if it, if it, if it goes, it's going to be like really good. But to me, once again, it was fueling that false self, prideful part of me, that part that didn't understand my identity, was insecure. I was doing it because once again, I just thought, oh, this is, this is success, right? This is sort of part of the success model. I'm not sure it was really anything I wanted to do. I'm not even sure in ways I found it really fulfilling. In fact, looking back on it, I didn't. It wasn't something I sought out because, oh man, this is, this is really Eric. This is me let's sort of pour myself into this. Right. Um, I was chasing validation. I was chasing success. I was chasing those kinds of things. I was trying to figure out who I was. I didn't know even then still. So fast forward, God just says, I think, you know, through love, what, what's it going to, you know, what's it going to be like when I take that peg out? So ultimately I get asked to step down, kind of have a, have a rift with the founder He's in Vegas. I had started, I had moved the headquarters to Phoenix because I couldn't travel so much. It was just, it was too much. And kind of two camps developed. And frankly, I didn't know how to manage it. I was, you know, I was doing my best, but I didn't know what I was doing in some senses in terms of, you know, it was a lot of things that were going on and we're running a hundred miles an hour in a hundred different directions. And so ultimately what happens is, you know, he wasn't going to go. So I had to go. So I get the call from the private equity funder. We go to lunch and it's like, sorry, Eric, it's not working. Great guy. Love you. It's over. Wow. Ouch. Yeah. So it, it was not related to the success of the business. It was a personality conflict. It was a personality conflict. And I guess in a sense, the success of the business in that, you know, really, I didn't know how to navigate the bridge and the, how, how to really navigate the personality issues, the directional issues. You know, he kind of wanted to go one way and, was a little bit of a loose cannon in ways, good guy in a lot of ways, but he wanted to do his own thing. And that wasn't really part of the strategic vision that we had sold and we had, you know, things weren't working and he wanted to kind of zig when we should be zagging. And it was all that kind of stuff and managing other personalities and, and it was the whole thing. And so I think looking back on it, God was just saying, you know, your identity in really unhealthy way, Eric, is tied up into this illusion you're changing of being a, you know, chasing of all oh, the successful young CEO startup, you know, you raised all this money and you're going to succeed and you're going to have stock options and, you know, look at me, right. Aren't, aren't I, aren't I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And so he's like, okay, well, let's see how it works when that's gone. So out goes that leg of the chair, right? Wow. So that happens. And then, um, about, about what year is that? So you've been at that like about three years, so I, it's like 2009, 2010, somewhere in there. That was sort of like 2007 or eight. Okay. So this is right before like the real estate market crashes. Wow. Like, a, yeah. So it was, so I've not good timing. Oh no, yeah. no. So that happens. And shortly thereafter, my marriage starts to hit the rocks. So, you know, my going back into my story, I told you, you know, right. Well, the beauty, my, you know, my wife, my identity with my, you know, all this stuff that's wrapped up in this relationship, you know, right. I mean, that's was in so many 
unhealthy ways, fueling what I thought was my identity, right? So God then says, well, okay, the job's gone, right? Let's see how, let's see how you do kid with when the other leg of the chair comes off. So we're mm-hmm. going to take the, we're going to take all that stuff that's wrapped up in an unhealthy way with, you know, success, money, business, career, vocation. We're going to take that away. Now let's, let's take family and the beauty away. Now let's see how you're doing. We're going to break here. Uh, and I've got to say, I really hate it when my favorite TV show leaves me on a cliffhanger with an episode. And I recognize that we're doing that to hear with this story. It's such a good story. And we're so thankful for you joining us on the OG Original Glory podcast. This is part one of a two-part interview with Eric Hansen. And it's, uh, it really speaks to the wildness of God. So a couple things. You can check us out at originalglory.com where you can find the blog, um, resources, our gear. I actually wrote a bro- blog about the wildness of God. Um, another thing, if you're enjoying this, if you're enjoying this podcast, this is a new, new adventure, new venture for us. We'd encourage you to follow the podcast. Please follow us wherever you find your, your podcasts and share it with a friend. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk, a lot of excitement about a revolution in the body of Christ with movies like the Jesus revolution and just an excitement in the air. But if there really is a revolution that's going to spring up, it's going to be ordinary people like me and you, people like Eric, people like Katie, walking this out in the context of our daily lives. And that's really a big impetus for this in, in the OG Original Glory podcast. We want to bring you relatable stories and show you that a deeper walk with God is possible and that that God can bring you life. So until next week, we're signing off. Thank you.